Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Sivia Schwartz Getzig. I am the director of JFN in the West, and I also have the privilege of being the senior advisor to Canvas, working with my colleague and friend Lou Cove. Um, and we welcome you all today. If you have any tech issues, just chat to me, uh, use the chat to me or to Reut Stoller, my colleague from JFN Israel. And otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Lou right now, and um, we'll go from there. Thank you, Sivia. Welcome, everybody. Um, so great to see so many familiar faces. Plus, I really like Amy Rubino's uh, little icon. It's a great icon to have for um, a conversation about arts and culture. Um, anyway, welcome to the session. This session's called uh, The Art and Culture of Funding Jewish Arts and Culture. Um, I'm Lou Cove, I'm the founder of Canvas, which is a collaborative fund dedicated to encouraging and supporting a 21st century Jewish cultural renaissance. And I say collaborative and I mean it. There are seven funding partners who joined Canvas in its first 18 months. Uh, I'm not gonna list them all here, but you can go to buycanvas.org and you can see. Um, but I will say that the first funding partner to join Canvas and, and to help make this possible was the Righteous Persons Foundation, um, which has um, been such a champion of the field. So I'm really excited that Rachel's here to talk with us today. Um, it's worth noting, I just wanna begin by saying, Canvas began as a series of conversations at past JFN conferences. So magic really can happen here. Um, it might be a little more challenging on Zoom, but I've already seen uh, important connections being made during this conference. And conversations like this one, uh, where we find like-minded funders and elevate one another by partnering together in our thinking and perhaps in our philanthropy can have lasting impact. Um, and this initiative, Canvas, is a case study in that. Um, so I'm going to introduce today's participants in just a moment, but I want to start with a creative exercise. We're about to have a high-level discussion about the kind of strategic thinking and hopefully coordination that goes into supporting the arts. Three of us are directly involved in funding Jewish arts and culture. One of us started and oversees one of the largest platforms for arts coverage in the country. And one of us creates art for a living. But it seems really silly to have a conversation like this uh, without centering it on creativity. So we're gonna begin with a little exercise here. Now you may have noticed if you've looked at your calendar lately that Passover is coming soon. Um, Canvas uh, is running a, a, supporting a project called Dwelling in a Time of Plagues. Um, this is 10 artists and 10 authors responding to contemporary plagues of our time. You can visit that uh, at plaguedwelling.com. Um, this is a coast to coast pandemic friendly creative response uh, to contemporary plagues, COVID, yes, but also systemic racism, food insecurity, single use plastic, homelessness, um, and so much more. So um, I'm gonna ask you all to participate in dwelling in a time of plagues right now. I'm gonna ask you the exact same questions that we asked the artists and the authors, and I wanna encourage you to put your answers into the chat. As you do this, our very special guest, Liana Fink, will select some of those answers and use the next 40 minutes or so to illustrate your responses. Liana is a cartoonist for The New Yorker. She is the author of A Bintel Brief, Love and Longing in Old New York. And she has at last count, and I looked last night, more than 575,000 followers on, 575,000 followers on Instagram. Uh, so uh, she is incredibly talented and she's also one of the most gentle souls I've met. So, um, Liana, so glad to have you here. Thanks for joining today. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah. So if, if folks are ready, here are the questions um, that, that, I, that I'd like you to post your answers to. Thinking about the world today, your personal world and the world that we all share, what plagues you and what liberates you? You're welcome to answer one or both. Um, and 
Sibia, maybe we could put it in the chat too. What plagues you and what liberates you? Liana, any, any guidance for folks before they start? I said I can't see I can't wait to see what people write and don't don't be shy. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so while we begin that exercise, I'm going to introduce my colleagues and friends, uh, Rachel Levin, uh, senior advisor to the Righteous Persons Foundation, who has at least two decades of experience in the field on this particular point and we've worked together on many related projects and, and happily are working together on Canvas as well. I wanna introduce Rabbi Mark Baker. He's the CEO of Combined Jewish Philanthropies in Boston, where he recently created a position there dedicated to funding Jewish arts and culture. Um, that's one of only two that I'm aware of uh, at federations in North America. So really worth noting. And we've asked Harag Vartanian, the editor in chief at Hyperallergic, which if you don't know it, you must go to hyperallergic.com and subscribe to all the newsletters. This is a leading voice in contemporary perspectives on art, culture, uh, and, and many other things in between. And we've asked Tarag to moderate the discussion. So I'm gonna hand it off to him, um, but I'll hand it off with a question so this conversation can begin in earnest. Harag, what the heck is a non-fungible token and why did someone just pay $69 million for a digital work of art? Uh, just kidding, that's <laughs> okay, a different great, session, great. okay. <laughs> <laughs> great opening question, too much for this session. <laughs> Agreed. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Lou. Um, I, I, I think we'll let, it let you know what an NFT is once everyone else figures it out. So, you know, but uh, on that note, I think we'll, I think, I think what that, the, what that struck that I think is really important here is just to understand how the cultural field is changing quickly and how a lot of these conversations we're having are really, I mean, I think in the case of NFT is a good example of a lot of people being caught, not knowing what is going on. And I think one of the conversations here that's really important is being part of these more long-term conversations that are going on in your communities, which I think is something as, as an editor of an arts publication I see, where the arts uh, part of the conversation is always something that isn't highlighted. Um, the way perhaps it should be. So um, we're going to start this conversation with some possible questions and start talking a little bit about, um, you know, just some of the broader questions here. The first one, of course, is the big question, and I think probably most relevant for the group here is, why do you invest in the arts? So I wonder, Mark, if you can sort of start with that um, to sort of like give people a little bit of insight <laughs> in your own kind of thinking around. Great, thanks, Harag, and thank you, Lou, for including me in this. Um, so let me just say one word about the you part of that question, uh, and then I'll answer. I think the question was why does CJP invest in the arts? But um, you know, I just say on a personal note, while I, I think I, I wouldn't call myself an artist, you know, I'm someone whose life has been touched by the arts. A big part of my time growing up in the theater, um, as an as an educator for most of my career, I watched and saw the power of, of the arts uh, in developing the hearts and minds of young people, and in particular in Jewish contexts, um, the arts as an incredibly powerful vehicle, uh, both for Jewish self-expression uh, and for the creation of a different kind of Jewish conversation. So I, I just say that I, I feel I've been personally touched by the arts in so many ways, and, and that clearly animates me and my leadership and my vision. Um, you know, I've been uh, the head of CJP now for almost three years, and the first thing I did in year one um, was uh, to go on a listening tour. Uh, we called it the 365, and with, a, with intentionality, we tried to connect with segments of the community that we knew we weren't in conversation with as much. I think many of us know that Jewish federations and a lot of traditional Jewish institutions are not as in touch with many segments of our community as we should be. Um, and I, I, I feel I received a kind of clear mandate from the CJP board, like engaging a broader range of our community, diversifying the voices that are around the communal table, kind of shining a light on and investing in other forms of Jewish expression. Like we gotta blow this thing wide open. 
Um, I feel really proud to be in Boston, which is both about history, but also about creativity. And that's true for CJP. And one of the stops on our listening tour, thanks to an amazing organization in Boston called now J Arts, the Jewish Arts Collaborative, um, run by an amazing leader um, named Laura Mandel, who's really put Jewish arts, I think, in many ways, like really front and center for our community. We had we basically reached out and said, can we get a room of Jewish artists? And there were like, we got 40 people came out and uh, mostly I just listened. And what I heard were some amazing things. First of all, nobody knew each other. Like even Laura didn't know most of the people in the room. And so what we saw was like this kind of pent up potential of Jewish artists that A, weren't in community with each other. B, oftentimes their Jewish identities and their artistic identities were separate. Right? They had outlets for their artistic identity, they had outlets for their Jewish identities, but they, they didn't come together. Um, and, and third was there was a real sense of like, we're not really sure there's a place for us in this community. Honestly, we're not sure the community is invested in arts and culture. At the same exact time that we know from data and demographics and, and community studies that more and more Jews identify as cultural Jews, whatever that means. And this just in the conversation when I said, what should we do? Basically, people said, like, you got to start investing in this, create opportunities for artists to create art and to do so kind of in a public way. And it just seemed clear and obvious to me that this is a missing piece of, of the kind of our portfolio of the way we try to invest in vibrant, thriving Jewish life. Like we do Jewish learning, we do Israel, we do caring for the vulnerable, but like, where is arts and culture? And honestly, it just, it was almost a direct line to, we got to try this. And uh, I'm really grateful that my colleague, Sophie Krenzman, uh, put her hat in the ring for that. And, you know, it's all about the right person, right time, right moment. And um, we, you know, we put some resources to it. And uh, all of a sudden, I think she's just tapped into amazing potential. But to me, there's just no question, if we are invested in a diverse, engaged, thriving, vibrant, generative Jewish community, we have got to create new ways um, uh, to engage people through arts and culture and to invest in artists who are going to create Jewish arts and culture uh, in that process. Great, thanks Mark. Um, Rachel, I wonder if you'd like to answer that same question next. Thank you and so good to be here and so good to see so many of you. I feel like um, before I answer this question, I feel in some ways like a little bit like an imposter because I, even though I've been doing this work for a long time, I was invited to be on the panel when I was executive director of Righteous Persons. And now, as Lou said, I'm senior advisor and the executive director of Righteous Persons is on Shana Trebosser. Um, and that is gonna be a public announcement very soon. But since so many of you know Shana well, um, it feels like with family, I can, uh, can announce it here. Um, and uh, there's nobody more thrilled and excited um, and proud um, than I am of phenomenal Shana. And, and she could be you know, talking about this as much if not better than I. Um, so you know, many of you know, um, we've talked about this you know, directly with some of you before that you know, Righteous Persons was started by um, Steven Spielberg by initially with his profits from his film Schindler's List. So, we started because of a story um, funded by a storyteller. So arts and culture have been essential to our strategy from the beginning. Uh, you know, we have funded, I think almost every discipline of the arts, clearly film, but radio, theater, photography, dance, um, other visual arts. And it really has been because of an understanding of the power of arts and culture um, to engage new audiences, to help cross lines of difference, to help people walk into complex issues, understand nuance, better understand history, better understand who we are, um, the list is long. And again, I think that part of that is an understanding of the power of storytelling and narrative. I, you know, I've, wa I've worked with Stephen for many years, but as many of you know, I'm the daughter of a rabbi. So an understanding of how essential narrative and storytelling and creativity is to Judaism and Jewishness. Lou started with talking about Passover. I mean, it's, it's a holiday around storytelling and one of the core narratives of the Jewish people around um, plagues and liberation um, and what's possible. And we reenact it um, in a theatrical story every year. The notion of how we've creatively adapted over the years is really 
a testament to creativity in the arts. So it's, it's always striking to me that it's been seen as such a, a nice luxury and a nice thing on the side, when in reality, it's so essential. And I think many of us through this pandemic, um, I think an, a clear understanding of the power of arts and culture um, you know, in times of trial and difficulty, it's, I mean, I think about the artists and the arts that have made a difference that have been a bomb, poetry. Um, you know, I think in the early days, Yo-Yo Ma playing his cello um, with songs of comfort. Uh, you know, a year ago, a group of people deciding to launch a Passover Seder online with Saturday Night Seder, which if those of you have not seen it, it is worth seeing, um, a group of Broadway actors um, enacting uh, the Seder for all of us and Jews and, and beyond the Jewish community. And so I think that this is a time that has shown us if we didn't know already the power of arts and culture in so many ways. Great, thank you. Um, Lou, I wonder if you had some uh, words to say about this. So my friends have done an incredible job of, of making the case. I'll, I'll give a personal answer, um, which is to say that I, I grew up in what I would describe as a hyper assimilated home. Um, didn't have our mitzvah, didn't go to Israel, um, was very removed from the Jewish experience, but very connected to Jewish culture. Um, at, least, at least the Sunday New York Times bagel and lox eating Jewish culture. Um, as I grew up and began my professional career, I was an editor, I started an alternative weekly newspaper focused on arts and culture. Um, and I had the great fortune in 1998 of walking into a building called uh, the National Yiddish Book Center. Now I didn't go in there for myself. I actually brought my in-laws because I thought, oh, this will interest them. They'll be interested in Yiddish and books. And I was completely swept away by the experience that I had there. Uh, if you have not been, I want to encourage everyone as soon as we're able to do it, to go. It's one of the most beautiful Jewish buildings in, in America. Um, but for me, what really struck me was kind of two things. The collection itself, which I wasn't aware of, and the fact that there was this entire literary canon uh, of Jewish thinking experience reflection, creativity that no one told me about. Um, and I thought, you know, gee, if I had learned about this a little bit earlier and perhaps if these books had been translated um, and distributed more widely and taught in schools, I might've had a different sense of connection. Um, number one, number two, I met uh, Aaron Lansky that day who I knew socially, but I met him in his, uh, in his capacity as the founder of the book center. And here was a guy who at that time was probably in his late forties, who was so full of energy, enthusiasm. It was a Sunday he was working and he was just dedicated to not just collecting a million Yiddish books, which he had done by that time, but also to digitizing them, translating them, bringing them back to life and getting them back into the hands of people that would actually wanna read them. It wasn't really about Yiddish, it was about Jewish. And um, I guess the other personal story, which I've told before is um, my grandfather left behind a little cassette tape in which he talked about growing up in Boston. Um, and he said, I was a young boy growing up in Dorchester, Massachusetts. I only heard this after he died. And um, I was sent back on my first day of school with a piece of tape across my mouth and a note pinned to my sweater that said, send him back when he can speak English because all I could speak was Jewish. And of course he meant Yiddish, but Jewish and Yiddish were synonymous. And to me, Jewish arts and culture, investing in this space, um, seeing a, a, what was a mid 19th to mid 20th century renaissance of Jewish creativity and trying to encourage and support a new one is all about ripping that piece of tape off and, and speaking about who we are, where we come from, what we've inherited and what we want the world to look like. And artists and creatives are best suited to do that work for us. Um, I, just before we continue, I, I'd love to ask Mark a little bit about that artist round table. Um, I, I was getting a set, I was going to ask you, did you, did the artists feel a sense of agency to engage with the questions? 
And what do you think was stopping them from engaging with the bigger questions you were asking um, at that time and listening to? Did you get a sense of what those could be? <clears throat> Well, let me just be clear. I, I'm not sure I would call it a round table, right? I mean, that implies there's an existing structure or platform for them. This was a one-time convening, and I'm just grateful that they said yes and showed up at all. Because I think one of the things that held them back, in all honesty, like what's the number one thing that holds most people back from speaking and weighing in? Not believing anyone really is listening. I mean, I, if I'm really honest and self-critical, I, I'm not convinced that those of us who are in seats of power and authority um, are always listening um, the way that we need to, to the people who are actually um, living the experiences we're actually striving to create for them, let alone empower them to create with us for themselves and for one another. Um, and so I think in some cases, there's not a clear sense that, that, that anyone's listening. And number two is there's no platform or real vehicles for the conversation to happen. That's been my observation. By the way, I'm not an arts funder. So I, I speak here with a great deal of reverence and appreciation for all of you and the incredible work that you've done already um, in and outside of the Jewish world. But like when I look at the Jewish community as I see it, there, there aren't the tables or the vehicles where the conversation is happening, let's say about what does it mean to be a Jewish artist? What does it mean to be Jewish and making uh, art in a community that is striving to uh, engage you and ensure that you feel you have a place in that community? Um, in what ways is Jewish art a powerful vehicle for having some of the really hard, important conversations about issues that really matter to us today, Jewish and broader issues? Um, I, I just don't see places, uh, enough places where that conversation is happening. Um, and uh, and I, so those I think are the two kind of primary primary uh, reasons. And I would say the third is just um, what we're talking about is the creation of kind of new mental models. Like I'm not sure the questions are always, the questions themselves are even clear. I mean, that's part of the nature of creating a new conversation, right? I mean, this is so, so Passover. I'm sorry to do that, but I can't resist. You know, part of, to quote Abraham Joshua Heschel, part of the reasons why religion becomes stale is we don't even know what our questions are that our story could be an answer to. And I think the power of great art to me isn't just offering new creative dynamic answers to old questions, but actually uncovering, discovering, recovering new questions uh, that really should be animating our lives today. Great, thank you. Um, Rachel, I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about how you've seen maybe things evolve or how your own work has perhaps evolved um, in this. And just to uh, pick up on Mark's point a little, do you see some of the intersections where these topics around Jewish artists and culture uh, intersect with some of the bigger issues that perhaps you're engaged in in your own work? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, artists and Jewish artists exist in the larger world with all of us. And so no accident that um, I think always it's, it's, it's been that, you know, years ago, who knows this, I, I read a um, piece that Jonathan, the uh, historian, American Jewish historian, Jonathan Sarner wrote about looking at Jewish life at the turn of the, you know, the last, last century, two centuries ago, late 1800s, and sort of looking at this, re this revival that was happening. And he, um, from it sort of came to this conclusion that um, great ideas come from those on the margins. That was one of his um, conclusions. And artists are living in that space. Creatives live in that space so much. Um, and so I think that they're able to create in different ways. I think what I'm even more so, so I've, I think all, a lot of our funding has always been artists sort of working in the Jewish space and you know in the broader space. Um, you know, there we've all, those of us who've been having these conversations are, you know, over and over again, the same conversation of like, what makes Jewish art? And it's sort of a, you know, beside the point conversation because um, so much of the art happens, um, happens at that place. So what I would say is in terms of how things have shifted, I think that we have more examples now of um, artists who are really doing quality work. I think there were lots of questions about sort of, you know, what is quality and, and, Jewish work happening in particularly Jewish spaces. I see more and more um, Jewish arts crossing boundaries 
um, and being in that in that place, taking on issues of the day even more so. Um, and it's exciting to see that happening more and more. And part of it, I think, is because there's more of an ecosystem for funding of Jewish arts um, than there had been. I think that there are waves. When I started, you know, 26 years ago, there was a foundation for Jewish culture. Federations were all giving a percentage of their funding every year to Jewish arts and culture. When that went away, as a lot of us know, there was the, the ending of the Foundation for Jewish Culture. And I have really seen in the past few years, um, you know, a beginning of a revival. And that's because of a lot of folks on this call. And when there's an ecosystem for resources and support, um, amazing things come out of that. And it's exciting to see. I mean, even Lou, you should talk about with Canvas alone, you know, sort of the, the efforts that have started um, the work we funded that's come out of Reboot and a bunch of other places, it's exciting to see. Yeah, I mean, I want to build just on that. I, the, the, I should say that the demise of the Foundation for Jewish Culture in 2013 was one of two catalysts that year for me, at least in terms of this work. And I think for, for both of Rachel and myself, the other was the infamous Pew survey, which you know told all of us that the community was falling apart and disintegrating and intermarriage. And you know there was a lot of hand wringing at the, this conference that year and in subsequent years about what the implications of that were. But when I read that, and, and I should say, those two events happened within a month of each other that the Pew survey came out and the Foundation for Jewish Culture announced that it would be folding. But I'm sure very few of you remember uh, the, the story about the Foundation for Jewish Culture at that time. Um, it, we, you know, we're Jews, we gravitate towards the bad news um, and the bad news about ourselves, but we also weren't acknowledging some really bad news that was happening in that moment. Um, so those were, those were kind of the two catalysts for this work. And that began a series of conversations, first with funders Jewish Funders Network members and others asking, what are the barriers to entry here for you? Um, because we saw, you know, the, uh, the Foundation for Jewish Culture going away wasn't the only uh, example of a kind of divestment in the space. Um, and some of the answers that we heard from funders as we did some research, and, and we did publish a report on this as well, which you can find on, on JFN's website, uh, we heard a lot of different answers about why, but but some of the examples of answers we heard is, I don't really know what the field even looks like. I don't really know. I don't know where to find excellence. Um, it somehow seems less than to me than other uh, cultural exports. Um, I don't know how to measure the impact of arts and of my investment on arts and culture. And that's a particular, um, that's a particular sentiment on the part of contemporary funders that I think all artists and arts organizations are grappling with, um, which is on the one hand, we as funders wanna be able to know if I make a contribution here, I make a grant over a, ser a period of time, how do I know if I made a difference? And we become really good at analyzing numbers and gather gathering data. Um, but when, when it comes to the creative fields, that's a little bit harder to apply. I don't believe it's impossible, but I think it's incumbent upon all of us to find some kind of shared vernacular, a shared language in which funders can ask those kinds of questions and uh, artists and arts organizations can give answers to those questions that feel honest and don't feel like they're selling out. Um, and I, I do think that there's a way to do it. Um, and we're finding that already. I mean, for one, one way in which Canvas and our coordinated investment in the field expresses this is that we're looking at capacity building. Um, we're very inspired also by what the Klarman Foundation has done in partnership with Bar Klarman, uh, their, their partnership with the Bar Foundation investing in arts and culture in the Boston area. Um, capacity building of arts organizations will lead to a more robust and a more vibrant arts and culture community. So that's something we can measure. Um, that's something we can we can look at and and take some uh, have some a level of confidence that that we can see where we're headed. Um, Lou, I wonder if I could ask just a follow up based on what you were saying earlier, which is what do you think could have happened to get you to that center that you took your in laws to earlier to engage? Like what could have happened 
to encourage you to get there? So it's, it's a great question, Harag, that no one's ever asked me. Um, so that's why we asked you to do this today. Thank you. Um, I, well, for one thing, I think um, had my parents been aware of or um, been passionate about it, that would have helped. I mean, my parents were very passionate about literature. They shared a lot of literature with me. Not a lot of, uh, not a lot of that literature. Now, had it, because it wasn't in translation, that was also difficult to do. But I think there was also a real effort among my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation to push away the past. And in this case, as I mentioned, all of that literature was written in Yiddish. Those plays were performed in Yiddish. Those songs were done in Yiddish. And it represented something of the old world that I think Americans of a particular era wanted to cast off. My grandfather, you know, having been shown very early on what it meant, uh, what multiculturalism meant for him, you know, he changed his name. It wasn't Cove, it was Itzkovich, of course, you know, it was, um, and I think, and, and, and that carried on to my dad too. You know, the real focus was to focus on your Americanism. Um, we're in a different era now where, I think new generations are really confident in their Americanism and they wanna know what's my unique slice of the pie. We certainly have a lot of issues with identity politics, but I don't think that there is any problem with, with going really deep in terms of understanding who you are, where you come from and learning about it through the creative output of your community. I also wanna to add to that, that it's incredibly important in terms of cross-cultural connections. Uh, there are a lot of funders on this call. If you if you don't invest in arts and culture, but you care about Jewish education or you care about an anti-Semitism, uh, you you care about uh, social democracy. I mean, these are things that are are spoken to in our culture and and our literature, our creativity. These are ways in which we can convey these messages about who we are to other people as well. This isn't just making Shabbos for ourselves. This is for everybody. And can I build on that just to say, I mean, I do think that we're experiencing a flattening of what Jewish identity and what Jewishness actually is in so many ways. Um, and, you know, both among Jews not fully understanding the nuance of, of our history and who we are, the complexity of identity um, and, and others. And so I think that arts is a way of helping to complexify um, the story of what, what, who Jews are and what Jewishness means. Um, Shane and I have been involved um, now with the Maimonides, Maimonides and others, um, a relaunch of the Jewish Documentary Film Fund that had existed at the Foundation for Jewish Culture um, into something called Jewish Story Partners. And the notion that this is a time that we have to, in not just in Jewish life, in all life, tell more complex and nuanced stories about who we are, who we've been, who we can be. And so thinking about, in this case, media in particular, but lots of other forms of of art to be able to better tell our, that story to ourselves and to others. So I'm glad you brought up that point, Lou. Um, Rachel, I just wanted to pick up a point I thought that you made that was really important about a lot of new ideas coming from the margins and how the artists often do function that way. And I think just to sort of build on what people have been saying in terms of what plagues them, a lot of these topics seem to be what a lot of artists focus on, which I just kind of want to mention that, you know, talking about uh, problem solving and certainly the fact that I think the public has a, has a certain generosity towards artists that perhaps don't exist in others in that artists are seen as these people who often do, you know, heal or engage with communities in unorthodox ways. So often in communities, there's a lower, like people are much more open to what artists have to say on some of these topics. So I think that's really important. But I wanted to continue with you, Rachel, talking a little bit of, and by the way, if anyone has questions, I see there's already one or two questions coming up. Um, just please, you know, please uh, put them in and we'll, we'll answer them directly. But I just wanted to ask Rachel, what, where do you think about where things are going next? Um, you know, in terms of some of the different things that are being um, supported or some of the thinking around this and, and what next steps might be? Next time might be for artists or for folks funding Jewish funding. arts or both? I think funding predominantly. Yeah, I mean, again, I think that one of the things that I've seen shift is an understanding of that there needs to be an ecosystem of support. I think a lot of funding of artists and projects are project specific. 
um, you can't make a living. You can't have a life if you know, you're going project to project. So trying to think about both an ecosystem of support. Um, you know, we're in a moment having just a pandemic, certain sectors are hit harder, performing arts especially. So when we think about, I mean, again, this none of this exists in a vacuum. When we think about um, our funding and how to resource, really thinking about um, those places um, that are hard hit. And also I think hopefully at some point when we're back, you know, physically together, just a desire for people to be in public communal spaces together and how do we resource, um, how do we resource that? I also think this is connected to a question you asked me before, which I'm not sure I really answered around artists and um, their role taking on, you know, big issues of the day. I see that in terms of how um, artists are being commissioned or what funders are doing. So I saw this with Canvas, sort of your call out to artists of really of intentionally having Jewish artists take on issues of the day and supporting that. So I think Lou, you sent this beautiful link to a biracial Jewish artist dancer who did a piece on lynching. Um, you know, I think that Shane and I were um, at, at Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery a couple of years ago. If those if people have knock on, you need to go to Montgomery. Um, and there's a lynching memorial. And I think that it it's sort of what you were saying, which is it's a it's a hard topics you can walk into differently when you're being invited by a vision of an artist. Um, and so I see that, you know, issues of um, how we are dealing with people who are unhoused, how we're dealing with issues of inequity. Um, I see artists taking that on and I see funders intentionally funding those um, collaborations and having artists take on harder issues. Um, so I'm going to go to one of the audience questions from it says, I'm curious how funders might look at investing in arts and culture as related to health and wellness. Can we look at impact being measured in our wholeness and general well-being? And how might we expand the notion of an artist by highlighting the creativity in all of us? Who wants to take that on? I'll take a stab and just say, I mean, there couldn't be a better time to be asking that question because what we have seen in the time of COVID is our incredible reliance on the creative community. I mean, how many of you, how many films have you watched in the past 12 months? How many books have you read? How many times have you logged on to events like these with performers who are, who are doing performances or just felt the sense of deep longing because you can't go to a concert, go to a gallery, um, have these, in, you know, go to a reading, have these in-person experiences. Um, I think artists have been sustaining our mental health um, and well-being this entire time. I, I wrote an op-ed for The Forward early on in the pandemic in which I said, um, artists are essential workers. And I, I, I really believe it. Um, and I also just wanna say, oftentimes as funders, we try and make choices between, oh, I'm gonna help feed people or I'm going to help arts and culture or, or something creative. Um, there was a report last week that came out from Johns Hopkins arts and culture nonprofits suffered the worst job losses by percentage than any other nonprofits in this country, 37% jobs lost. The next lowest was in education and the percentage of jobs lost was less than half of that, it was 15%. So it, this is not just a, you know, an arts crisis, this is a humanitarian crisis and a social crisis. And at that very moment when they're all losing their jobs, when they can't perform, when touring artists, I mean, they, their, their careers just literally evaporated overnight. Um, they, they're helping and supporting us. And, and this is a time more than ever where we need to be supporting them. Uh, with Canvas, we released $180,000 in emergency relief shortly after the pandemic started. It was an amazing gesture on the part of, uh, at that time, six uh, uh, partner funders who were really nimble. We don't, um, we don't directly fund individual artists, uh, but, but we were able to make that decision quickly. We intend to do it again at at least that amount of money in 2021. Um, but I encourage everybody here to, to do what you can to support the, the creative community because to, to question, they are supporting our wholeness and wellness right now. No, that's a good point. I think particularly 
during this last year, as many of us have had to mourn remotely, and I think music and other forms of the arts have definitely been a powerful way of bringing us together and sharing those experiences. Mark, do you have any thoughts about uh, looking at the impact as a wholeness and general well being? Well, it's, I'm, first of all, on a very concrete level, um, I don't know if Seth's alluding to this in the question, but just the other thing we know right now about, you know, just from the, the early research. Uh, that we're seeing is that obviously the rise in mental health challenges, you know, we knew it was an epidemic before COVID, but as a result, you know, young people feeling socially isolated, the heightened anxiety and depression, you know, I, I, I think we are going to be taking on looking at uh, new ways of investing in overall health and wellness for our community. Um, and the intersection between that, the development of meaningful, relevant, nurturing Jewish communal life and Jewish identity. And I think the, that arts can be like a third pillar of that stool. I think that the idea of the arts, not only as a kind of like arts as at nourishing the soul in terms of us kind of consuming arts, but arts as a vehicle for self-expression, for kind of making meaning of a very challenging time. Um, I, I think that some of the the kind of challenges, especially for young people today, have to do with the complexity around identity and this kind of sense of how do I make sense of my place in a world where boundaries and structures are just kind of just disintegrating all around me. And one of the problems is that language is insufficient, not to mention the fact that contrary to popular Jewish belief for the past few thousand years, not everyone is great with language. Not everyone connects verbally, um, but the fact our, our lack of kind of vehicles and modalities for making sense of my situation kind of traps one inside one's own experience in a way that I think does not contribute to a sense of, of, of wholeness, you know, well-being. So I actually think starting to fund and invest in, in, in ways that privilege other modalities besides verbal um, arts as a vehicle by which people can then kind of both connect to their Jewish identity, but make sense of their own situation and build community with others, I think we'll have a very powerful and, and, and meaningful impact on our efforts to just kind of promote greater wholeness um, in general. And in particular, we're already seeing kind of pilots in Boston, like uh, we're, we're, we're gonna be, I think, funding a, a pilot around Musar, which is kind of the Jewish ethical spiritual tradition and sacred sing singing, right? A kind of a, a group that is gonna be exploring identity and community and ethics through both uh, kind of the, the textual Jewish ethical tradition, but then through sacred singing. And I think that's just to me, like the tip of the iceberg of what's possible. Right. Rachel, is there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, thank you. I just, first of all, I really appreciate the link to the UPenn study, um, yeah, which I've, I've seen and I think important for us to look at. And I, I see the word despair in one of the, I think in one of the links. And the word that we haven't mentioned is imagination. I don't think we've said it yet. And I think it's so important to think about um, artists and the arts linked to imagination. Cause I think especially in moments of despair when things are really challenging this sense that something else is possible, that the future is not yet written, that all of us are writing it together, um, hopefully with eyes open to you know, our past and to where we are, but that something better is possible. And so I think that that we've seen how critical um, that is. And there's a, a unique role for arts and culture and creativity to play in that. Right. Lou, I'm going to direct this next question to you, but uh, before I ask this question, I, I want to quickly ask, how do you measure, because I know with a lot of these, uh, with the impact, people love to measure things. How do you measure the fact that with arts and culture, the impact is often much more mid or long term rather than immediate sometimes? Now, have you thought about what are those measurements and how do you sort of quantify those if you can? I, I think that it's really difficult to do. I mean, I, I used to push so hard against this sentiment early on in my career, talking about these issues. And I used to say, you know, no one ever asked Herman Melville what the impact of Moby Dick was going to be. Um, you know, you just, if, if you cared, you, you had faith in, in the creative person, in their imagination, as Rachel eloquently pointed out, um, and the potential of, of arts and culture. I do think. Um, I, I spoke with someone recently uh, from Silk Road, from Yo-Yo Ma's Silk Road, who's a producer there who was saying, uh, and I asked a similar question, how do you evaluate? And she said, you know, it's a combination of belief and assessment. So we have, we have a certain level of faith in, in the creative community and the creative individual. 
and then we assess what's possible with the project. And I do think that we can work with artists and, and, and other creatives to think about what the long-term impacts might look like. And we could talk about what they're gonna be, but I, I think the belief part is what we really need to uh, work on. That's a muscle we, we need to rebuild. Great. And so the question was, can you share one or two best practice communities in terms of robust and well-funded Jewish arts and comments on what makes those communities work so well? So I was actually starting to respond in the chat. Um, I, and I obviously, I, I feel like Boston's a real leader. That's why I asked Mark to, to join us today. Um, and, and Mark will, will say and has said, if you weren't here at the beginning of the conversation that um, this initiative, J Arts in Boston, uh, I put a link in the chat earlier for it, um, has just been, I think, transformative and also has really set the bar very high. The quality is really high. The creativity is high and it's run by a person who is all in um, and who is just an incredible advocate for the field. So that's one. I would also point to Toronto. I mentioned earlier that Toronto now also has a position um, called Director of Arts and Culture. I, I said at the very beginning for those that weren't here that there, I'm only aware of two federations in North America that have someone with that title. Toronto's the other, and Toronto has, and I'm putting a link here, this Cultura Collective. Um, that's a community where the arts are really robust in Toronto writ large, and where the Jewish community is catching up. I know that Montreal also is looking closely at these issues right now. And there are people that are, are trying to do something similar there. Um, but I wish I had, you know, a really long list to share with you all today, and I don't. I, th I think that it's really important if you're thinking about, gee, I, I've heard something today that was compelling and I want to invest in the field. I'd encourage you to look close to home and say, you know, does the Federation in your community have a budget line to have artists in residence or to give fellowships and grants to artists when your local JCC is hosting events and having performers come on, are they paying them for that? They should be. Um, there and there are some useful tools out there to let you know how much they should be. If they don't have a budget for that, help underwrite that budget line, and let's see if we can make that a permanent budget line in in local agencies. Um, it, it it could be with your local synagogue. It could be with your local day school. Um, there are so many ways to do it, but I think when we when we build it into the infrastructure, we will see many many benefits from it. Not just the work that emerges, but we'll also see the people benefiting and, um, and responding to it and making it more part of their curriculum, their social justice work, whatever it is. I asked a really great question, but I'm not sure it's the perfect question for this panel. So I just want people to sort of, you know, take a look at that question. I think it's really important, but since most of the panelists aren't artists, it just may not be the perfect question, but it's super important. But I do want to ask the question, uh, had had asked here, which is, are there models for funders that invest in art making that challenges mainstream ideas or politically sensitive areas? Does anyone want to wade into that before we uh, take a look at Liana's uh, drawings? Do you have an answer, Rod? I mean, you might be best suited to answer that. Um, you know, I think the I think part of my questions earlier was build up to this a little bit, which is um, I think I think some of the challenges that in in some of the more successful um, projects I've seen tended to be those that really. Um, invest in something that initially may sound like a wacky idea um, and uh, and I think those are the ones where people in the community after often come out and sort of engage with on their own terms. And I think that's really has been quite successful in different ways. Now, who are some of those organizations? Creative Capital in the arts space has certainly uh, attempted to fund projects that other people may consider very wacky. And sure, maybe not every project is, you know, uh, a home run, but uh, I mean, certainly most of them are su very successful and some of them are definitely home runs. Um, so I think that's a really uh, good potential infrastructure that people can look at. Um, but if, if anyone else has any thoughts about that, I would love to get their thoughts. 
Great. Okay. So I think we can move over to uh, um, Lou. Do you have the Do you have the floor next? I I think. Well, I want to bring Liana uh, into the conversation. Um, so for those that weren't here at the outset, Liana Fink uh, is a wonderful cartoonist um, for the New Yorker and for others uh, with. Um, and also the author of A Bintel Brief, um, which if you haven't seen, you must, uh, as well as a, a very popular Instagram feed. Um, and Liana, before we look at, at the work, and we asked Liana at the very beginning to um, illustrate answers to questions that participants in this webinar uh, gave in the chat. So you may have seen people putting in answers to the questions, what plagues you or what liberates you or both. Um, so we're going to see some of those, but but before we do, I just wanted to ask Liana a question because um, Liana, you got your start um, through a um, fellowship with Six Points, um, and I was just wondering if you could just say a little bit about what that experience was like for you as an artist, as a Jew. What 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 happened there? Um, it was it was really magical. I had the grant. It, it started one year out of college for me. I'd had another grant, another small, like short fellowship that I was like hanging on to tooth and nail as like the, like an extra year of college before which I would have to start to support myself and figure out my career. And, um, and, and I applied for six points, like sure I wouldn't get it, but really desperate because I didn't know what I would do the next year it was it was right after the 2008 financial crash so I didn't think I'd be able to find a job and I was just really really trying to find a, a, a way to make my art and and show it and feeling really lonely and um and before and and then I did get six points and everything changed and what changed, what I expected to change and what did change is that I was given some attention and recognition for what I did and some money so that I, I didn't, I could work part-time instead of full-time and the part-time jobs that came to me were wonderful jobs that, that came to me because of Six Points. It was working for the forward and tablet and making art for them. Um, and what changed that was totally unexpected and totally wonderful is that for the first time I felt like my art self and my Jewish self could be the same self. I'd grown up in Jewish schools. I went to Solomon Schechter's, I went to Young Judea camps and we were, we were pretty active in the Jewish community. And I I'd never felt like, I, like my art self had a place there. And I'm sure that had a, a lot to do with when and where I was growing up kind of suburban New York in the 90s. I, I hope things are better for like shy artist people now, but but I'd never thought of, I, I'd always felt deeply Jewish in that I was connected to the stories and like the, just the history, but I never felt that. And, and I know, I knew that my art, like wanting to tell stories came from that, but I never felt that there, that the Jewish community was a place to share those stories. And when, once I went to art college, I thought that would be the place to share those story, stories, but it, it really wasn't. I, I felt like they were, like there was a lot of me that was very specific and people didn't get it. And in Six Points, I really felt understood and I met other people I really related to maybe for the, the first time as an adult and felt like the art had real integrity and and it, it was just really, really nice and a really rare experience. Thank you. I, um, for those that don't know, the Six Point Fellowship folded and that was one, one of the other organizations that we lost. Happily, Rebecca Goober, who, who ran Six Point, started a new initiative called Asylum Arts. Um, we, we fund that through Canvas. Um, and we really believe in funding networks of artists and supporting those kinds of infrastructures where people can find each other, support each other, cross-pollinate ideas, find new career opportunities. So it's really exciting to hear that that worked for you, Liana. 
Um, let's see your work. Okay. Please um, we only have a couple minutes. So, Can I do these so Liana's going to share our screen. So, and, and what plagued us and what liberates us. I thought hard about whether, I, I know these are a collaboration between me and you, and I didn't put your lines at the bottom. And maybe I should have, I was thinking about it. So this one was, a, someone wrote that what plagued them was trying hard to make life be joyful and kind of meaningful. Um, and I thought that was really, I've felt that way a lot too this year. Like, like life is very much life this year, but it, the meaning has kind of shifted and we're all kind of scrambling to figure out what, what it is. Um, Can you share your screen? Oh gosh, sorry. Can you see it? Yes, can you make it full screen? Yes. We'll make a point. I just want folks to know that we'll sh we'll share these. You'll you'll we'll find a place to put them and make them part of dwelling in a time of plague so that everybody can see the outcome from today. Can you see it? Oh yeah, that's great. And, okay. it, and that's I'm just gonna good. zoom through these because oh no pun intended. This is people <laughs> connecting over the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the person who is both plagued and liberated by feeling very small in the universe. Oh gosh, is that, was that five? One, two, three, four. Oh, and this is the year of the introvert. I'll say. <laughs> I felt that strongly and then it went away. So I don't know what that says. That's great. Oh, so amazing. Thank you so much, Liana, for participating in this. I'm sorry we didn't have more time to, to spend with this, but, um, but, we, we love your work and we want to encourage you to do more. Um, I promise that we'll find a way to share the results with everybody. Thank you all for joining today. Um, it's, it's really great to see you all here. Uh, support the arts. Um, feel free to be in touch with me or Rachel or Mark or uh, Harag, any of us, uh, if you have ideas. Um, and between now and then, stay healthy and we'll see you all soon.